This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Cow-Calf Extension Specialist from K-State, Jason Warner, begins today's show by sharing why producers may want to test their forages, especially this year. He provides factors for people to consider when sampling. Continuing the show is K-State Research and Extension Research Fellow Gabrielle Cameron and her mentor Brian McCornack with the work she has been doing over the summer involving machine learning. K-State Research and Extension Horticulture Agent from Riley County, Greg Eyestone, finishes today's show as he discusses how to divide and replant irises. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned into Agriculture Today, and we start our Thursday show discussing forage sampling. And then to talk about it, we have Key State Extension Cow Calf Specialist Jason Warner. Jason, thanks for joining us today. Good to be on. Appreciate the opportunity. Forage sampling, why is it really important this year? So, forage sampling is a topic that I think most producers certainly understand the value of and the importance of. And when we think about making accurate, well informed feeding decisions, whether that's for a set of cows or a set of calves after weaning. But it's always a topic that we routinely receive a lot of questions from producers on, not only throughout the year, but particularly going into this time of the year. A lot of producers by this point of the year have got a pretty good handle on what they're most likely going to be working with from a forage inventory standpoint and a hay production standpoint going into the fall and winter. And so I think this year, particularly when you look at kind of where we are from around the state, it's been really variable in terms of what we've seen for moisture that folks have received. And I think there's going to be a lot of variability with it and what producers might have to work with as they make fall feeding decisions. And so that lends into, again, why understanding some of the basics with forage sampling, I think, is going to be really key this coming up fall and winter. And Jason, when I think about forage sampling, I automatically think about hay bales. However, that's not the only thing you can sample. We typically think more about dry forages, but it all ties back into our overall forages that we have to work with. And so silages are a key, important component of that as well, too. Uh, One thing we want to keep in mind with silages is that just depending on how they're stored, if they're put up in an ag bag, in a plastic bag situation, or in in a bunker, whether that's an earthen bunker or a concrete bunker type of a situation, we always just want to stress safety with producers when they're going and sampling just because we want to make sure that uh, folks are not exposing themselves to a higher amount of risk uh, due to an avalanche or, or a silage pile collapsing and feed covering up an individual. So we want to make sure that we're really careful on that. So one thing that we want folks to keep in mind when they're sampling silages is that regardless of whether you're sampling out of a plastic bag or out of a bunker, is that we want you to use the loader bucket off of a skid steer loader or off of your tractor tractor, front end loader, to come in and scoop and collect a a full bucket sample from that loader, then come back and lower that all the way down to the ground at a safe distance away back from the face and subsample out of that. The main thing that we want to avoid is folks going up to the face of a silage pile and trying to collect samples off the face of that again because of the risk of collapse there. And also we don't want folks to be able to go into a plastic bag and have the bag down over their head as they're trying to collect those samples out of it. So it's best to come in with a loader bucket and collect that feed pull back and at a safe distance. But it's really critical to make sure we're taking good, accurate samples, both silage crops and dry forages as well, too. So what are some of those key factors to get those good and accurate samples? The thing you always got to come back to is is what information are you attempting to gain by taking a forage analysis? So understand what tests that you're going to try to to analyze or what tests you're going to you're going to analyze for and make sure that the package or that the analysis that you're going to request from the laboratory that you're going to send a forage or feed sample into is going to give you the information that you're looking for. A couple of big things that folks always want to consider is that, you know, we can analyze forages and feed samples really one of two ways at a commercial laboratory, either through uh, NIRS, which is near-infrared reflectance spectroscopy, or the wet chemistry method. And so really one of those two methods is what most laboratories will utilize. And so we're going to see some differences there with regards to cost and and turnaround time. 
but there are times where either one of those may be the most appropriate uh, route to go depending on the feed sample that's in question and what information that you're wanting to gain from that. For most laboratories, they will have good predictive equations to be able to analyze forages that come in from a common or a single source, but where there may be more question is if it's a mixed forage sample or certainly a mixed feed sample and you've got feed components uh, from different sources that are all in one sample. And so if you have questions on that and whether or not a laboratory is able to analyze for that, if you've got a certain laboratory that you're working with, make sure you, you talk to them, pick up the phone and ask them and clearly describe to them what your sample is and they can help you make an informed decision on whether or not you need to run an NIRS or a wet chemistry analysis on that. And that also goes back to why proper labeling on forage and feed sampling is is really critical because if the laboratory is having a difficult time interpreting and understanding what your analysis is, they may not be able to properly run it. And so you got to make sure that you're proper labeling and you're taking good samples as well too. And so that leads me into my second point is that, you know, we really want to make sure on, on dry forages, when we're thinking about sampling hay bales, you really want to make sure that you're using a, a good forage sampling probe to help you collect those samples. And, and and it, it sounds simple, but I've seen and worked with producers where folks have taken hand samples or grab samples from the outside edge of the bale and you know, long stem hay, put that into a plastic bag and send that into a laboratory. And, and we know that laboratories will consistently receive those types of samples from producers. And the challenge with that is not only are we not necessarily getting a good leaf to stem ratio to give us a much more accurate sample but at the same time too we know that if we use a coring device or a probe that is going to allow us to be able to take a much more representative sample so it's going to account for the field variation much more accurately there so in most situations we're going to see a lot of forage probes that are going to be anywhere from three eighths to maybe a half inch of inside diameter or core diameter that's a good size of a forage probe that you want to make sure that you're using if you use a forage probe or a core that's going to be a lot smaller than that or has a smaller diameter, we may not be able to get a good, accurate uh, leaf-to-stem ratio. And conversely, if, if you're using a forage probe or a bore that's got a much larger diameter, more than a half an inch, particularly if it's closer to an inch or bigger than that, uh, number one, it's going to be a lot more challenging to get that probe into that bale then also at the same time, too, it's going to take a lot more sample than what might be necessary. So those are some key things that folks want to make sure that they're thinking about. Use a forage probe that can core in or probe in at least 12 inches, preferably closer to 15 to 18 inches into that bale. So you want to make sure that you're using a probe that has enough length to it to allow you to, to be able to take a good reflective, accurate sample and, and make sure that you're using a good device that allow you to be able to do that. So something else that we often will, will have the question asked is, well, how many samples do we need to take or how many bales do we need to take out of a lot that we actually need to need to probe for analysis? That's a good question. There are some guidelines that can help you determine how many that you actually need to be able to take based on confidence interval, and, and that can help uh, determine essentially what degree of accuracy we would expect to see with either a protein or an energy estimate on a, on a feed sample. A good rule of thumb is about 20% of the total lot size, but again, there are some guidelines available on some of our extension publications that can help you determine the number that you might need to take because that might be significantly less than that. For some forages like prairie hay where we don't see as much variation in crude protein content, the number of bales that we would need to sample in order to be 95% confident that our sample is, is going to be within a certain range might be significantly less than that. And so that can help avoid oversampling. If we can avoid uh, sending in more samples than what's necessary, that can help reduce our costs, but also help cut down on the time needed to take samples as well, too. For people who are maybe wanting to find out some more information about how to sample or related to forage sampling, where can they do that? On ksubeef.org, there's a couple of good publications that are available to download that will walk through some of the steps and procedures necessary uh, for taking good, accurate forage samples, uh, but then also, to helping to determine the proper number of samples that's necessary to take. And so there's one that's titled Forage Sampling Procedures and Equipment, and then there's another publication that's titled Forage Sampling and Analysis. And so most of our extension offices around the state have forage probes available that they will loan out that you can be able to use. And of course, your agent can help you take those samples 
samples and, and walk you through some of the basic steps that you need to keep in mind when you're taking forage samples. If you've got forages that are in question, they can help guide you on that process and, and, and help you make sure that you're making an informed decision with not only how you sample it, but then also mo- probably most importantly, what do the results, what does the information mean? Most commercial laboratories today, you can get a forage analysis conducted that would cost anywhere from maybe $15 on the low end to maybe $25 per sample on the high end, just depending on the laboratory and and what you're analyzing. But we can get good information, protein, acid detergent fiber, neutral detergent fiber, dry matter, and some macro minerals like calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, to get some good basic information to be able to put rations together, particularly for cows, but then also for growing calves as well too. One thing that folks always want to keep in mind is that particularly as we get later on into the fall, and if there's areas around laboratories where we've got a lot of drought-stressed crops and folks are really concerned about nitrates, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that a lot of laboratories, they can get really backed up early on throughout the year. And so making sure that you're giving yourself enough lead time from the time when you when you take those samples and submit them into a laboratory, make sure that you give yourself, you know, a week, maybe 10 days of, of lead time there in order for them to process it and get the information back. And, and so that's why if you're thinking about, you know, weaning calves maybe here at the end of August or sometime early September and wanting to put some rations together and thinking about making some decision on on some things, now is a good time to be getting those forage samples collected. So you've got plenty of time to get the information back to work through and make informed management and feeding decisions. That was K-State Extension cow-calf specialist Jason Warner. I will link the resources that he mentioned in today's show notes on actoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our show now with another Key State Research and Extension Research Fellow. This research fellow is from Tennessee State University, Gabrielle Cameron, and her mentor is the Department Head of Entomology at Kansas State University, Brian Kornack. Brian, Gabrielle, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invite. So, Gabrielle, first to get started, what is your background and how did you end up here at Kansas State University? So I am Gabrielle Cameron, a senior at Tennessee State University. Um, My major is agriculture leadership, education, and communication. I came to Kansas State University this summer to work in the Kansas State Research and Extensions Fellowship Program. And this summer I got to do work under Dr. Brian McCarnack in the Department of Entomology, studying the accuracy and usage of deep learning tools and machine learning. Gabrielle, you mentioned machine learning, but what is that? Machine learning is basically the process of teaching a computer how to make predictions based on the data that you feed it. So it's just showing things to a computer in a way that it can understand and learn it from that way to like implement that into like a learning algorithm. And so, Brian, was this something you've had experience with? And then Gabrielle just came and helped team up and create more work on it. Yeah, actually, Ivana Grijalva, just a recent PhD graduate in my lab, uh, developed the Lady Beetle algorithm. He's also developed a few other algorithms to, to say, count aphids on a leaf, because at the end of the day, even entomologists don't really like counting aphids on leaves, let alone producers and consultants. So how do we do that in a way that is also accurate? And so in this case, we're looking at a model that can look at maybe seven or eight different lady beetle species, and you feed it a new picture, and it gives a prediction based on, again, what it sees in an image. And so... Gabrielle's task was to see actually how accurate it was. So we wanted to really break it, in other words. Because the, the data that, that she used, or that Yvonne used for this, came from iNaturalist, which is basically a lot of hobbyists from around the, the world that are taking pictures of lady beetles. We got about five or 6,000 images that you feed into the computer, right? And then it, you train it, basically, and then you validate it. But uh, what Gabby wanted to look at is what, what factors actually break it. Were you able to see what factors break this system? We were able to kind of make some conclusions about it, like assumptions of where it may break. Um, We're thinking distance plays a huge part into it, um, the accuracy of the predictions, and also how well the image is cropped or image size that may play a part into it as well. And for this, maybe not a human going out and taking all those pictures, but maybe incorporating a drone into your project? 
Yes. So um, what we're thinking is that when it comes to large scale fields that can take a whole lot of time and a labor to go through, scout those fields and go through acres of fields trying to identify a certain pest such as aphids or identify lady beetles. But however, if you can deploy those same sensors and deep learning tools in drone usage, you can like cover more area in less time. So it may actually work better in a sense for efficiency and time. And since, yeah, and since the original model wasn't really developed using drone sensors, uh, sensors mounted on drones, that was kind of the first step was just to see at so what distance. So, so, so Gabrielle would look at maybe 10 centimeters versus 80 centimeters, so close to a yard away. Uh, so basically finding that maybe past 30 or 40 centimeters, like the accuracy and identification didn't really work, but actually detection still worked pretty well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of it, though, is just how much how much beetle to background you had, for example. So the more you cropped it around those beetles, it did a better job. So those are things that we didn't really know. But now that Gabby spent the last how many weeks counting, <laughs> counting, understand the accuracy, we have a we have a better handle of again distance from sensor and your subject really does matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, also lighting. So she tested this on a, a, uh, using some a sensor on a drone uh, at fixed distances, and that didn't work. But a lot of it we feel is based on lighting, but also cropping. But also, you know, as we develop these these tools, really understanding like where they're going to be used and the data that we use to generate those really does matter. And so some of the next step is for us is really like deploying this on uh, some of the more modern sensors that do a, a tremendous job. It's really incredible what you can see from about 15, 20 feet away in terms of how clear some of these some of these insects are sitting on leaves. And so at the end of the day, like, how do we automate that? Um, how do we cover wide, l- uh, large areas in a short period of time? Uh, drones do that. I've walked through lots of soybean in August to early September, and it is not a fun process because the rows are closed. They're well above my, my chest in some cases if it's irrigated, uh, and you simply can't get to the other, other end of the field. So how do you deploy something like a drone that's got a sensor that can cover a wide area uh, and then take pictures and then try to use a machine to basically tell you what's in those? And we've mentioned lady beetles, but is there more application for more insects moving forward? Yeah, and so we've, yeah, we're looking at uh, aphid detection. And so, again, not just... The predators that are feeding on aphids, but how many aphids do you have there, which are which are tied back to decision tools like thresholds, injury levels. And so, yeah, aphids, uh, we actually have a, a couple of papers out uh, that Yvonne has, has led looking at counting aphids on leaves, for example. Uh, also working with Dr. A.J. Sharda and his crew in the bioag engineering, actually looking at ground vehicles to be able to deploy those between rows. Uh, and we've got sensor and spray systems, so you sense it. Do I see aphids and then spray it? Uh, this is kind of more of a futuristic, like, what does egg look like? At the end of the day, though, there are some very adaptable tools that can be applied to basically decisions that are being made now. But this is one of those where, yeah, you can actually detect aphids underneath a canopy of sorghum. Uh, what we're trying to test is, okay, can we spray maybe on a per-plant basis? Uh, so, again, using less insecticides, allowing natural enemies to do their thing, uh, to, looking at this as an integrated approach, so not just relying on one tactic. So what does this really mean for producers in Kansas, but then also Tennessee and across the whole country? So initially with this type of research for producers, this just means that they will better have something to aid their work in their fields, and which will, like like we said, cover cover most of their fields without them having to do it in less time. It also is a really, really great aid because when you think about things like um, pest identification and pest management, it usually takes like a lot of trainings and exposure to how to do that well. And if we're trying to knock down the uses of insecticides and promote conservations within their fields, this would be like a great avenue. Would you consider this then a lot of different avenues of agriculture coming together to hopefully benefit the industry? Yeah, technology plays a big part. I mean, I think you've heard K-State, part of its economic prosperity plan is digital agriculture and advanced analytics. This is more on the lines of that advanced analytics part. Like, can we can we train a machine on how to identify lady beetles in a, in a, in a picture, right? And, and it really now depends on where you take those pictures. If you are out sampling a 100-acre sor- sorghum field and you only have 15 minutes, can you be sampling, right, a small part of that field because it's close to the road, right, because you also have another 20 fields to maybe go look at the rest, the rest of the day? While you're looking for that 20 minutes, could you be sending, in this case, an autonomous vehicle to go capture more images in parts of the field that you're not at? So 
I kind of look at it in terms of, yeah, it's not necessarily replacing what you do, but it's maybe providing a lot more confidence to what you're seeing in a, a, such a limited part of the field. And it goes back to, you know, that when we talk to growers at, at the end of the day, you know, if you're talking about yield, right, which is what we're doing is trying to help them conserve as much of that yield as possible. And some of the control tactics don't cost that much, yet could have longer term negative effects on environments and also potential for creating resistance. You want to really use those products only when you need them. So at the end of the day, technology can can play a big big part in that. It's not something that you can just use tomorrow. Unless you do have lady beetles, then we can send you the link of like how to identify these. Uh, but for for us, the next steps are like how do you really deploy this on a system that, again, can be flown in 15, 20 minutes, can cover hundreds of acres, depending on where you're, where you're flying, uh, number of pictures that you're taking within a given period of time. But at the end of the day, like how do you upload that to a small, maybe, you know, micro microprocessor that then tells you, hey, by the way, you actually had a lot of lady beetles on this part of the field. Maybe you just want to go check it out. And that might be very different than what you saw in the part of the field where you were sampling. So this is, again, going going back to providing a little bit more confidence, efficiency and time. End of the day, not replacing you, but also, you know, maybe maybe educating you like, oh, I didn't know that was a Coleo Magilla maculata. But now I, do. <laughs> now, now, I do. now I do. But for us, it's like it's a lady beetle. Maybe it doesn't necessarily matter what species it is that you just have lady beetles. But this is where they are, because guess what? They're better at finding aphids than we are. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if we can find lady beetles in the field, maybe that's where we should maybe be focusing some of our early detection for aphids with, with an important crop. Gabrielle, it sounds like you've done a ton of work on this project, and there's still more to be done moving into the future. But what has been your favorite part of working on this? My favorite part of working on this has to be just getting to work with Dr. Yvonne and um, Dr. Bryant on actually deploying like this system and seeing how it works and just seeing how well everything flows together. Because, I mean, like before coming to this, my, like I said, I probably have never done any work around insects, but actually just seeing how well, like seeing the background of what they're doing and actually seeing it implemented in real time and like before my eyes and getting to be a part of that experience and such something that can be really big in agriculture is like my favorite part. I loved how well the lab ran. It was really fun. Um, They enjoyed my excitement. Yeah, Riel, Brian, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and discuss this research project you guys have worked on over the summer. Hey, thanks for having us. Thank you. That was K-State Research and Extension Research Fellow from Tennessee State University, Gabrielle Cameron. And she was joined by her mentor, the K-State Department Head for Entomology, Brian McCornack. We're now cutting to a short break on agriculture today. But when we come back, we'll be joined by K-State Research and Extension Horticulture Agent for Riley County, Greg Eystone. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. Bearded iris can be divided any time after flowering. In the Midwest, this is often done in late July or August. This allows the replanted portions to have time to develop new roots and become established before freezing weather arrives. K-State Research and Extension Horticulture Agent for Riley County, Greg Eystone, discusses how to divide and replant iris. Greg, I guess this is really the time we think about dividing iris. Yeah, we kind of go through a rest period here for many of our perennial plants. And so uh, if you have some iris and maybe they're not blooming as well as they have in the past, getting overcrowded, this would be an ideal time to dig those up, divide, and kind of refresh your iris bed. So what's the process then? How are we doing this? So they're fairly easy. They're very shallow rooted. And so it's not too hard to dig those clumps up. Usually dig the whole clump up, remove the old rhizomes, which are just kind of swollen tissue that you see there on the ground that were previously ones that produce flowers and uh, the foliage, but are no longer necessary. So you're really the growing points are on the very ends or where the the leaves are. And so you can discard all that other material and uh, get back to where the real actual live tissue is, which is connected to those leaves that you'll see coming up and providing that food energy for the plant. Kind of a a bulb then or kind of a T-shape, a Y-shape? What do we got going on here? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Kind of a Y-shape, I guess, is what you're looking at. So you can break off that portion that is connected to the leaf tissue and to that rhizome, that swollen area that you see. What that's doing is you're you're kind of 
moving those iris back to where you originally had them because as they grow, they just creep out and get bigger and bigger. And so if you're running out of space that way, we have to push them back into where they were originally. And uh, you just snap them off. You can use uh, a knife if you need to, but most of those just kind of break off. I'm assuming that some of these are going to be in great condition. Some are probably not going to be as well. They might be damaged, maybe some soft rot. Yes. Uh, so you do want a good kind of maybe sturdy or a kind of a hard swollen rhizome when you replant. There are some insect or disease issues that can occur out there. And so if you have tissue that's kind of shrunken or soft rot, which would be a disease, which would, uh, as rot things do, they smell, uh, you would be able to tell that, that you would want the healthy portion to put back into the ground. And rhizomes of iris are right at the soil surface, if you will, so you don't really plant it or dig it deep. You just put it right there at soil level. That leaf tissue is building up that food energy, so ideally you don't need to cut that back, but sometimes they're kind of floppy or top-heavy. And occasionally uh, we have the need to remove some of that weight and cut those leaves off a little bit so that your rhizome can get down into the ground and and root back down. So you you can play that by ear if you want, but uh, we want to make sure those roots of the rhizome start to take hold in our soil before we get into the fall winter season. So because this is a thinning process, we want to make sure that we're not over replanting then? Yeah. So uh, and and you kind of mentioned the, the why thing. So you kind of place them as a as a Y or a triangle, and uh, they'll continue to spread out. So you bring them back to that area. You'll probably have a bunch of leftovers if you want to. Uh, you can share those with friends or put them in people's cars when they're not looking, those kind of things. <laughs> but they are pretty sturdy, hardy plants. And so even if you, let's say you have time to dig them up, but maybe not replant, they'll store okay, maybe in the garage or something like that until you are ready to plant. If you haven't done a soil test since uh, the last time you planted, you may want to do that every three to five years to make sure there's the nutrients there for those iris to prosper. So check out with your local uh, extension office for soil testing information. Fairly uh, simple and affordable process to make sure that uh, your planting bed is ready to go for your iris. And we should see them come up again the next year then? Yeah, you'll just kind of see them resting and they may get a little bit of vigor uh, here in the fall season as it cools down. They may have a little desiccation to those leaves during the winter time, a little browning on the edges, but uh, they don't necessarily go away, the leaves themselves. And so next spring you'll see a lot of new flush growth come out of those divisions that you made and uh, things should be going well. Typically they'll bloom that next year so that's why we kind of like to do it now when they're resting you don't use up a lot of resources and so next year you should have a pretty good iris bloom. That's K-State Research and Extension Horticulture Agent for Riley County, Greg Eyestone with information on dividing and replanting iris. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.